podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Daniel Wilson. Daniel is the co-founder, COO, and head of product at Legion Health. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, JP. How you doing? Doing good, man, and we're delighted to have you. So, Daniel, let's start with yourself, please, first and foremost, as we do with all our guests. Could you give us a bit of an overview of your background in technology and what your journey has been like from where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and what's brought you to where you are today? So my background in tech probably goes all the way back to when I was around 12 years old or so. I was living with my family in Argentina, you know, looking for outlets because it was difficult being a 12 year old that didn't really speak the language of basically everybody around me. And one of the outlets that I found is I actually stumbled onto a copy of Adobe Flash that was already installed on one of the uh, like computer lab computers of my school at the time. And that kind of gave me this interesting uh, sandbox, I suppose, to play with, started to learn how much was possible with a computer in terms of being able to build things that did not exist in the world before. And when uh, my family and I came back to the U.S., it was around 2007, 2009 area. And Uh, Those were the early days of the iPhone app store and mobile devices. And so the first like real thing that I built and shipped was actually one of the earliest drumming apps for Apple's iPhone. It was called CrashPad. I got about 150,000 free downloads and about 5,000 or so paying users. So that was a fair bit of income and validation actually for at the time, I believe I was like 15 years old. and. Uh, When I got to university after graduating from like high school, I went to Princeton as part of the class of 2018. I actually kind of took a little bit of a detour from the tech space. I had kind of, uh, through those years of experience, building flash things and Ivan things, realized that I didn't really love programming, but I loved what programming made possible. And so that detour was kind of into this big data and finance space, actually. I majored in something called operations, research, and financial engineering. There's a lot of things like structured credit products and options in the finance space, pricing of airline tickets and the like, also some operations and optimization stuff for things like supply chain. And when I was graduating, I had this interesting decision to make, which was I had an offer from like bank on wall street to work on uh clos collateralized uh loan obligations and that was 9 a.m to 2 a.m working primarily in microsoft excel and the other option that i had on the table that i was uh, particularly interested in was actually working on microsoft excel of microsoft as a technical product manager so the second one is the one that i ended up going with i learned and incredible amounts there about like large user bases, how to perform user interviews that are actually representative of the diversity of users that Microsoft has taking advantage of all their products and also what it's like to work at a really big company. After about like two, two and a half years there, realized pretty quickly that Microsoft was an ideal place for me because I wanted the opportunity to play around with something truly new and novel that would have perhaps a very small chance of major impacts on the world. So that's kind of a story all the way up through uh, before leaving Microsoft to start Legion. Uh, yeah, it leads nicely into my very next question, which is tell us about the origin story of Legion. First of all, set the stage. Who are Legion, who you are, what you do, mission of the business, how it came to be. And then we can talk about the data science, the engineering, the AI behind the scenes. 
Legion Health is a company that right after leaving Microsoft, I, and then my two best friends and college roommates, Arthur and Yush, started around May of 2021. And what we are really trying to do in the world is everyone has talked a lot in the past couple of years about this quote unquote mental health crisis. You can get into the details more later, but it's impact is a lot more significant than I think most people realize because as it's rolled up into that term mental health crisis, it obscures some of the pretty like, terrible things that are actually going on when you look at the details. And what we sort of set out to do going into building this company is we actually didn't really know specifically which of the very many problems in mental health we actually wanted to solve. But we knew that this was the large problem bucket and issue within the world that all three of us had a core personal experience that led us to caring about it. So company's mission is basically to leverage technology to empower humanity in the quote unquote fight against the mental health crisis. And as we were exploring the space, talking to as many like leaders, thought leaders, executives, and founders in mental health, uh, which was in the middle of a boom at the time coming out of COVID, we realized that among the problems with all of the opportunity created by telemedicine now being okay, there were lots and lots of digital mental health companies that didn't exist in say 2019 and 2020 now made it possible for like therapists and psychiatrists to see patients online over say Zoom. And so there are like say 200 plus of these various different companies trying to both capitalize on that opportunity, but also like really support the population of the US that needed that mental health care and was unable to get it. And those companies ran into two key problems. The first one is when you actually are able to care for these patients, how do you actually get in front of them? How do you build patient demand? How do you drive them towards your service under the belief that like you're the best ones to offer them the care they need? How do you actually just handle this demand acquisition problem? And the second one, which was prioritized lower by most because not having any like inbound demand is a deal breaker for any company. The second one, which is similarly important though, was how do you handle the supply side? It's the best way to see patients and provide them with psychiatric care or therapy, then you probably need to hire psychiatrists and therapists in some capacity. But if that demand question is so up in the air that you don't really know how many patients will be coming in looking for care at any given time, hiring therapists or especially psychiatrists can be a significant source of burn and be very high cost because as medical professionals, uh, at least on the psychiatry end, they tend to make a fair amount of money. A lot of companies played around with that. They tried to use contractors. That wasn't the best experience for these like magical professionals in general. They usually skimps a little bit on engineering resourcing to make their lives easier. Heard lots of stories about Google Calendar being used as the booking system. And funnily enough, Microsoft Excel being used as their electronic health record platform. They really did not have the best user experience there. And so what we were able to do is to say, okay, we're a little bit late to what you can arguably think of as a digital mental health gold rush. And if it really is a gold rush, can we possibly be the ones selling the pickaxes? And in this particular case, the pickaxes was the supply side. Long story short, the first kind of pass of our business model was, hey, if these two problems, demand and supply, are the fundamental issue for all these new companies. We're a little late to the game, and we see an opportunity and a competency to just handle the supply for everyone. Let's well, be to be. Let's be the advocate for the clinicians. Let's actually be able to focus our product resources on their experience and the things that make their lives easier and make it easier for them to give patients the care they actually need. And that went really, really well up until about the end of last year. So what happened then last year is, as you may be aware, the uh, startup funding environments dried up across pretty much every industry. 
And in digital mental health, something that I hadn't quite gotten to yet is the typical and standard approach for most of these companies to actually acquire patients was through investor money, of which there's a lot. There's infinite money. The funding environment's been great. So we'll just spend it on Google ads and Facebook ads and market directly, not come up with some kind of novel patient experience or special offering that actually makes their company uniquely good. Instead, just spend the money to get the patients, scale, grow, don't worry about CAC and the like. So a lot of those companies that want that sort of low product effort approach, we'll call it, no longer exist. And that was pretty scary for us as a B2B company to lose a majority of our prospective future customers. And it was scary actually for probably only about a month because after about a month, what we realized is number one, sadly, the need on the patient end for mental health care is still growing way faster than most people outside of the space can imagine. And number two, the original reason we went into the supply side focus and didn't compete on the demand end was there was so much competition. The place we are now is that we have that supply side competency. We've solved problem number two, and we have the clinical resources and capabilities necessary to actually do a really good job of seeing patients. So we, in long story short, simple terms, without having gotten into some of the really interesting data and AI opportunities, we've basically just gone from supply side only to opening up demand. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team, or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. Speaking to an audience of data professionals, whether it's data scientists, data engineers, ML folks, talk to us about the team that you've assembled and what it's been like day to day. Give us a look behind the scenes of the data and the broader technology team at, at Legion. Yeah. So the really interesting thing about the mental health space is I've talked about like the number of digital mental health companies that spun up post 2020. And one of the things that we increasingly noticed as a trend, as we tried to build tools for clinicians to work with their systems better is the technical competency in the space is surprisingly limited. And what we came to understand is that it's sort of a function of in mental health in general and where a competition for like patients and the approaches to patient care is basically in the form of like fax machines and paper notes and paper calendars and the like, you can be bleeding edge on the technology front by using online scheduling and Zoom. And it's sad that led a lot of these early startups in the space to decide, okay, that's all we need to bother with them. If we can be a very successful company, subtly not as digital as we might claim and not as critically based in technology as we might message. Because of that fact, the number of say data professionals and those with competency in AI is again, rather limited. And that's a real shame because the thing that we've also come to like really grasp or realize in depth is across the mental health space. There are really only two problems. Everything rolls up to either matching or quality. And matching roughly is the question of, given that a patient needs mental health care, how does that patient know what kind of care they need? How do they find a provider who actually can offer that care? How do they find one that actually takes their insurance? How do they find one that they actually would get along with and can trust? And how do they find them that's actually available? There is a like recent study, actually, I think about like a month or two ago by like the Senate finance committee chair or something. And he looked into what's been increasingly referred to as ghost networks. 
And what they did is they did a sort of secret shopper study where they would go through health insurance directories, looking at mental health providers, and basically just reaching out and calling them. And if I remember the statistics correctly, it's roughly 33% of the mental health providers' profiles on those directories were inaccurate or just outright wrong. The phone number was a disconnected line. The like phone numbers that did go through didn't get any callbacks. And all in all, at the end of the day, they only actually had an 18% success rate, 20% success rate scheduling appointments. And so the ability to find just providers to help with your mental health care is really terribly limited. And that's interesting because it's translated for a lot of people into, oh, okay, well, this is a supply and demand problem. There's not enough supply to handle the people who need care. But what we found in talking to a lot of the mental health providers is there's actually a really large number of them that are sitting there wondering where the patients are. And to be deep in the mix of this problem area and realize how many people need help. And to also speak to therapists and psychiatrists who have 50% of their time on their calendar unfilled, not actually spent on helping patients. It's a pretty wild realization and something that has been really compelling for us to solve. The quality thing I can talk about later if you're interested, but the TLDR there is nobody in mental health seems to be able to agree on what it actually means to have quality care, what it actually means to be giving the patient what they need. And it's fascinating, but you often can't like, with very high confidence tell if a patient's actually getting better. So there's a lot of really interesting applications there, but the recent one that we've been diving really deeply into is the matching problem space. And there's definitely some other interest growing in this sort of application of language models and the like. I believe Airbnb actually mentioned recently that matching specifically is going to be one of their core focus areas of how they leverage language models. But uh, in our particular case and ending my little monologue here, the TLDR on our exploration into matching is, as many know, GPT has technically passed the MCAT. And among other medical knowledge, that means that it's actually very highly competent in mental health. And what it allows for is a problem that actually people have tried to solve in the past, but the technology hadn't been there to make this possible, is that question of how do you like find a patient that likely needs mental health care, assess what kind of care they need, match them and their needs and preferences across the, like, a corpus of every single mental health provider in the U.S. and identify the correct ones for them and get them to that first appointment so they can receive care. That's a really hard problem that's even difficult to solve with humans. Like, you in particular need a fair bit of mental health background knowledge. But because language models in general have enough of that, and because they can also do the extra what was traditionally manpower overhead of reaching out to the provider, say via email and scheduling on the patient's behalf, or at the very least confirming that the person is a good fit. All of a sudden, this really, really difficult step for patients and even getting care in the first place is a very solvable problem. So I can dig in anywhere you're interested in the details, but that's where we're zeroing in on to apply a lot of the new tech that's become available within this past year. Yeah, that's super exciting. And using the, the remaining minutes that we have, the area that I'd like to zone in on is, is really just bringing it back to the people who are going to help you continue to build Legion and go on this mission together. So when you look at the next 12 to 18 months from a growth and a headcount perspective, again, speaking to an audience of data professionals, what opportunities are there going to be for people who are interested in the healthcare, health tech space, like what they've heard here today and have that background of, of across the bill, whether it be on the data science side, data engineers, machine learning, where do you see yourself adding talent and what opportunities are there going to be for people to come and join you on this mission? So through this point in the company, we've actually been able to run our engineering and product team fairly lean, working with, I believe we have three 
generalist engineers in full stack working directly with me right now, maybe three and a half if you count me as an engineer because I still write code. And what we're quickly realizing is they are absolutely amazing. They allow us to attack this whole language model space, which arguably most engineers don't really have more than say three months of experience in. But what we've run into and in double clicking the problems very briefly in the matching space is there's a lot of data collection, pre-processing and cleaning, and then architecting the best way to get the relevant components into a vector DB in a format that can actually be retrieved efficiently, that can actually result in being able to make match comparisons against a patient's needs without blowing up token cost or response time. I think the rough napkin math we did on if you were to one-to-one -one compare a patient with every single one of the several hundred thousand providers in our data set run you about thirty to forty thousand dollars per patient match. And so a lot of the optimizations and work we've been doing on the architecture end and on the prompt engineering end, caching end, et cetera, is to figure out ways to use the information we've learned from previous checks to actually inform future ones, to structure data better, to check things piecemeal, to leverage cheaper models for components of the problem that don't need a more advanced comparison. So one of the things that we're going to be doing to your other question going forward is we're going to be pretty rapidly scaling our engineering team. And the things that we're going to be looking for is actually similar to our current team, simply people that are very passionate about and excited by mainly number one, the space and how important it is to the world, but also number two, the opportunities created by LLMs, language models, and the corresponding infrastructure to support them and are able to therefore under that passion, pick up whatever is needed because the best way to solve this problem isn't something that anybody has been able to figure out through this point in history. So. Definitely focused on like scaling the language model competency for our team, much less so than say front end. Uh, we also have a position opening soon for just general data science and trying to see if there's other applications for the insights we're able to gain from so many inbound patient profiles and information about providers and the way they interact with patients. Uh, there's opportunities to package that as additional products for insurers by giving them anonymized roll-ups of what we see of mental health patients. And perhaps most interesting is to someday soon, hopefully, be able to start poking at that quality problem. Being able to answer, how do you actually know if somebody in mental health is really getting better and getting the care they need? That's something that no one has had enough data to answer or to even create metrics for. But that's something that I strongly believe we will have soon. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on today and talking to us. I really appreciate you sharing your own background and your journey and what's led you to where you are today with Legion. It was a great insight into what you're doing with the team at Legion, the space in which you're operating in, and just how big an impact you can have utilizing modern data science, data engineering technology to provide a real platform that can have an impact in a space that will obviously be one for the greater good. So we wish you, the team, and everyone there at Legion the best of luck in the months and years to come. And we look forward to having you back on the show again in the near future. Thanks very much, JT. And yeah, hope to be on again soon. This has been fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldous Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.allthis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.